Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have Atco, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five-star Yamaha and Mercury mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric golf carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama, and also brought to you by Killer Dock. As anglers, we put a lot of time, money, and passion into fishing, but most of us do not have a fish cleaning station that we are proud of. Many of us are suffering from dock dysfunction. A rotten table with rusty metal, this is just no good. But the dock enhancement that we've all been waiting for is finally here. Killer Dock uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more. And also, United Bank. United Bank knows what an important role agriculture plays in our local economy. At United Bank, they are here to support local farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness, including real loans for farmland, equipment loans, working lines of credit, and more. Truth is, they deeply value the contributions agriculture makes to our communities, and they help our local farmers build successful businesses. They want to see you succeed. Learn more at unitedbank.com or stop by any United Bank branch. United Bank, all loans subject to credit approval, equal housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. All right, folks, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. I am joined today with co-host Captain Richard Rutland. I'm Butch Theory. How are we doing today, Cap? Shoot, if I was any better, I'd be looking as good as you do. Oh, man. <laughs> Especially in the flesh today. I Come like on this. Now. I know. We haven't seen each other in a while. I know. I know. Busy, I'm looking, looking forward to it. Been getting up to the forum some, doing some work up there, getting my hands dirty, feeling like an old man. Mm-hmm. Really make your back ache whenever you dig a trench <laughs> all day one day. Oh, that's how I feel too. I'm uh, about to sell one of my uh, sell one of my contenders, and I've been buffing and waxing and doing a little bit of gel coat sanding this that the other. I get home I'm like, oh god, I, you don't ever feel it the day of, but the next day you're like, yep. golly, I know. elbow grease. I know I'm not even forty yet, and I'm complaining like I'm old. You know, <laughs> I know it. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to feel like when 60, 65 rolls around. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, have to grease the joints a little bit. Yep. Have to ask Captain Bobby some of his <laughs> tips. Right. Huh? <laughs> Sucker's still going. He can work all of us on oh, the table. Yeah, I, I can guarantee know. you that. He's just he, like my dad. He Sucker got that. Don't dug, ever stop. He got that Doug Avrescato energy, man. I don't know where they get it from. Every one of them, uh, every one of them's like that <laughs> balls to the wall oh yeah that's it what you up to man oh man just crazy weather it has been the weather's been a uh, little nuts very typical springtime uh you know we'll usually have some alabama springtime how about uh, that <laughs> yeah but uh just for our area the weather's been fairly typical you know you have some uh really pretty days in between these fronts you know and then you get a front like what we had last night and stirs everything up heck it was blowing like you know oh, man 20 plus knots all day yesterday out of the southeast uh everybody oh. i talked to just about nobody went out that i could tell and then uh then you turn around and you get like completely different wind direction today and the the tides way up and so you, you just have these conditions that are kind of all over the place you know so fishing wise i just been trying to kind of look for some consistency and uh and that's sometimes hard to find i think we're going to hear about that a little bit in some of our yeah. reports okay, i know uh with the inshore report uh when we get a uh, positive pad on i'm gonna uh i'm gonna talk about the inconsistency of some of the fishing and whatnot but there are some things that are really consistent you know sheephead and redfish have been real consistent but speckled trout uh, not so much been a little bit all over the place yeah i mean talking about these swings and all i mean golly i can't imagine being a fish right now it's hard mm. enough for us up here i know there's <laughs> they don't know yeah. what the heck's going on yeah yeah they're as confused as all of our listeners you know, like, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> Where do we go? Heck, I'm right there with them some days too, man. It's, uh, it's, it's tough, but like I said, that's, um, that's typical transition phase, you know, yeah. uh, where, where you have, you have some days of some really good success. You go back a couple of days later or the next day and it's like, poof, they're gone. You mm-hmm. know, where'd they go? You know, and you're all, you start scratching your head and like, yeah, man. So yeah. yeah, it'll uh, be interesting to get the reports today and see what everybody, how everybody's faring. That's right. I wanted to uh, tell this story. I think it was not this past Monday, but the Monday before last, I had a podcast listener, uh, Steve Calthrop, um, with us. He's the, uh, 
owner of um, Jesse's over in uh, Bonscor oh, or nice. Magnolia River. Mm -hmm. uh, took them fishing. We 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 can, we had a we had a, like one of the struggle kind of on the struggle bus. But of course, we had like water that was two feet low all day too, and from one of the north wind. But uh, I had a first happen to me. We were uh, we were fishing down in Grand Bay, and I walked to the back of the boat to check on something or get a wind knot out of somebody's line or something. And I was looking down next to the edge of the boat, and I saw a fish right next to the boat. And I was like, what the heck is that? And I saw it kind of roll a couple more times. And I looked down there, there's a speckled trout sitting next to the boat. And I reached down with my hand and grab a legal speckled trout out of the water. Like nothing wrong with it or whatever perfectly fine and uh threw that joker at the box you know and that was like i think we only kept like uh, only caught about like four or five keepers that day you know wow. so <laughs> kind of helped make the box but that was definitely <laughs> uh a first for An me was, yeah, yeah yeah i just reached in the water with my hand and caught us caught a fish you know? <laughs> i feel like that's what uh some people probably think i just do on a normal basis you know but <laughs> right whisper them whisper yeah. them up call yeah. them up Yep. That's funny. I had some other guys. I had uh, one of the uh, one of the fellows that owns the slick lure on the boat with me the other day, and we were fishing around Point of Pines down in Bay La Battery, and uh, we heard some guys shooting uh, shooting guns down there the other day, and we uh, we heard a, a handful of bullets whiz by our head like like I was in the movies, you know, like, you know, oh, like boy. go by us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we hit the deck and got out of there. <laughs> I would say so. That was another first. So two firsts in one week, caught a fish with my bare hands and got shot at for the first time in my life. <laughs> I think I would much rather the first situation. Oh than my the goodness second. gracious. It, uh, it absolutely, it, it scared me. We had a, we had a kid, you know, like a, a teenager on the boat and Did you have a change of underwear with you. Oh uh, no, I didn't, but, uh, <laughs> I might've could have used it. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, that's not fun. No, uh -uh, it wasn't Jeez. at all love. Uh, so I don't know who that was or what was going on down there, but we got the heck out of there. Rather not stick around and find out. No, for sir. Sure. No, sir. Uh, and I'm sure as a, lo a lot of our listeners are probably seen on social media and uh, just from uh, word of mouth, we've kind of, we've had a, uh, a fish kill, yeah. um, which we'll kind of probably try to wait to uh, get into with with patrick garmerson in a little while but yeah um, it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts i know you've been talking to some people down there that know that are smarter than we are about it so yeah be interested to hear about that yeah I've, I've seen some and they all seem to be about the same size and just seems kind of odd yeah it does i'm not going to be terribly worried about it just because kind of what we were talking about before we jumped on here it's kind of a cyclical thing you know uh every year sometime in the spring mm -hmm. we usually have a uh a fish kill and I, ca I can't really tell you with my own eyeballs that it, this one's like much bigger than the other ones that I've seen but I've definitely seen where you know there's hundreds of fish in a for sure in a tide line or washed up on the beach or whatever and it's usually like bull reds and catfish or something mm -hmm. either uh gaff tops or hard heads and kind of happens every year right around the spring sometime in the spring so well and like we were saying earlier too there's been a hard 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 south wind mm -hmm. to blow them all up you know if it happened on the hard north wind, you would never see Probably. it. No, it wouldn't be all over social media that's and all right. that. So that's right. Who knows about that? I know we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to it. Sounds like we got uh, got a good lineup. We do for sure, man. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. Let's go see what the ultimate beach bomb's been up to. Ultimate. Matthew Isabel, welcome back to the show, man. How you been doing? Doing really good. Glad to be back. I'm glad Richard's here. He was he wasn't with us last time. I was on the no, show. He wasn't. Not the last couple times we've missed him. Yep. Yeah, and and part of being the ultimate beach bum, like what I look to is if I can impress Richard, <laughs> <laughs> which, well, which I, I've got some good news, Richard. I've All got, right, go I, ahead. Uh, you gave me a project a while ago and I've worked on it and I'm, I'm excited to share this news with you that I have learned to use a bait caster. Oh, watch out. Nice. Hey, uh, you want to know what's funny about the uh, bait caster subject right now is I cannot use a bait Still? caster right now. Yeah. I've Dang. got a, uh, I've got this thing in my left hand called trigger finger on my ring finger, and it just hurts like holy hell to grip a bait caster right now. So I'm I'm all spinning rod right now. That's funny. You're oh. going bait caster, and I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm regressing. I'm going uh I'm going back the other way. Uh, that's that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I I thought about you. Yep, I've been uh, I've been going to the chiropractor and getting some acupuncture and doing some exercises and stuff like that. So hopefully I'll be ready for springtime wade fishing here when, here before we know it. Won't you know? be long. I know. Time to yeah. get healthy. What you been uh, What you been catching with your bait caster? So I I had to learn. I was kind of forced to, or not not necessarily forced to, but I've always wanted to learn. You know, and I feel like as being a complete angler, you know, you just need to be versed in all the equipment. And uh, I was I had a trip to Okeechobee. Uh, Lake Okeechobee and you know a lot of pitching and flipping and I knew that the guys I was going with if I was trying to 
keep up with them and, and just using a spinning reel, it, it would be a little difficult. So I bought my first bait caster, practiced as, as much as I could in the, in the yard. And then I spent two full days of fishing on Lake Okeechobee with just a bait caster. And that'll definitely learn you up real quick out there on Okeechobee. So, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. It, was a, it was a good time. We, we caught a lot of bass. We didn't catch anything big. Uh, like the biggest bass I personally caught on that trip was like two and a half pounds. But the uh, the winds were like really bad the two days that I was there. Like it was blowing like 20 miles an hour. And it was really hard to find clean water. And that's where we would only places we could catch fish. And the guys that I was with, like they don't even live there. It's just a trip they make every year. They just so they fish there once a year. Um, so they're not like experts on the lake or anything. They just have a few areas that they're familiar with. So uh, we were kind of winging it for the most part, but it was a good trip. Caught some bass. Did y'all do any punching? Do you know what punching is? No, I, like I mean, there was some thick stuff that you probably could have. I mean, we were mostly just uh, like pitching in holes and stuff that were you know not and, not uh, really pun- not punching through the grass or anything. That punching thing is funny. A buddy of mine uh, who uh, he's actually been to Okeechobee and done it before uh, explained it to me one day about like punching through the lily pads. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. throw you throw your lure way up in the air and it lands and pops through the grass or the lily pads, and you just basically sit there and fish in that one little right. that one little spot kind of jigging it back up and down i'm like all that one on one cast you know they're like yeah that's how it works i was like no you know they use uh these big long rods with like a lot of backbone and like 80 pound test line and stuff mm-hmm. r- ripping them out of that grass but uh they catch some monsters down in okeechobee like oh yeah uh, oh it's worldwide yeah it's great world known yeah great biggins down there so that's fun yeah i've never fished it yeah yeah what? that's what i was hoping for but i i did catch a big bass on the trip i actually caught one i didn't have a scale but based on my subscribers average guess <laughs> you know me hold it, it it was about seven or eight pounds so which Good is one. like the b- biggest bass i've ever caught but i caught it at a con at the pond at my condo so <laughs> <laughs> uh so that's you funny. know I, I go to Okeechobee and catch a two pounder, but you know the pond's hey. got the got the big ones. Hey, whatever, whatever bites, whenever it bites, right? Yeah, you know. man, I'm I'm not gonna complain about that. Okay, you gotta be ready for everything. Oh yeah. What else you been up to? Yeah, you know, what else? Where else you been going, man? That sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and I I actually really enjoyed the baitcaster. Like I'm I'm super stoked that I feel comfortable with it and probably will use it even more. Are you a left hand reeler on the baitcast? Uh, yeah, you know I figured that was pretty standard. Let's see. No, 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 no. Standard's right hand. So Standard's like right I, hand, that's right. I just, I just went with the right hand. Like I, I real left-handed with the spinning reel. Me too. But I, I wanted to learn and get comfortable right-handed with the baitcaster because I know that's kind of standard. So I, I try to be, uh, what's the word? A- ambidextrous. Yeah. yeah. It, it's not really, it's not really, it, it's not really ambidextrous to do it that way though. I mean, I'm a right-handed person. Me too. And ever since I was a kid, of reel to spin and rod with my left. Me too. You turn that's with the way your to left. do it. Yeah. Right. And yes. Then, and then, yeah, and then yep. bait caster or regular, you know, conventional mm-hmm. yeah, tackle re- reel your right hand, you know? So that's, that's just being a regular person. I call <laughs> all the other people in the world. They're goofy handed, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I cannot reel you know, spin and rod with my right this, hand. Uh-uh. This is a big, <laughs> this is a big debate actually, you know, in know. the fishing world, like, oh, yeah. you know, this whole thing, but after, and I had never used a bait caster up until here recently. I think my mic's clicking. I'm trying to avoid that. So I'm going to try not to move too much, but after using it, I kind of get it. Like I can, I can see where it's more comfortable me being right-handed with a bait caster for whatever reason, like it is more comfortable for me to reel with my right hand, but my, a spinning reel, it's, it, I don't, I can't explain it. And I don't know why that the design of those two rods, it's, it's comfortable to reverse that as right-handed, but it is like, I mean, I, I don't know that I could use a bait caster in real left-handed and be comfortable. Like, yeah, like I don't know why that ma- doesn't make or make sense. <laughs> my problem is with the bait caster is, when I'm using a spinning rod, like to work like a slick or a top water, my right arm works way better. So when I have a yep. bait caster, I'm holding it in my left hand and I'm reeling with my right. My left, I don't have the same twitches that I do with my right. Sure, hand. So that's sure. my biggest problem with that. Sure. Yeah. I'm way more comfortable work. Like if there's a lure that really needs to be worked, like yeah. I, I pretty much have to use my right hand and, and a spinning reel. But like on a bait caster, I've used like straight retrieve stuff or just like, you know, in Okeechobee, we were pitching into holes and like th- these bass would eat it. All right. And Slow you're not bass. really work. Slow yeah, bass you're not, stuff. Yeah. You're not working it. You're just throwing a jig in there and letting right. it eat it. Great. Well, what else, man? What you been doing? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, surf fishing, we're, we're around here. We're, we're getting very close. There have been a lot of redfish and something that was really cool. We had a few opportunities a few days here recently uh, where I was able to just walk the beach and you could actually see the schools of redfish. And there weren't like huge schools, but like they would be real close to the beach and they were just chilling. They weren't cruising. I mean, really just hanging out. And I'd see pockets of fish that would be like three, four fish, you know, maybe one or two here and there. And uh, that's something that's really fun to do is just walk the beach and sight fish when you get those opportunities. Of course, it's got to be calm, clear and and all that. And uh, I've I've been able to do some do do some of that and just started really set rig fishing again, trying for Pompano. Uh, It's getting right. A few have been caught in our area. They did have like a one day run of Pompano east of here. Yeah, I saw a bunch of them over there on 30A area. It was one day. Like the so the day before, you know, people will catch maybe one or two here and there. You hear about that one day, I think it was like a Saturday. Everybody just whacked. I mean, insane day. I actually went the next day on Sunday and fished the same stretch of beach over there that uh that that everybody was catching them the day before. And we didn't get a bite. And everybody else on that same stretch of beach, same story. Not a pompano was caught. And it like, and I knew several of the guys that were fishing that day, that same stretch, you know, very, you know, good at what they're doing. Like they knew what was up and uh, nobody was catching fish. So it was, it was crazy. Just that like one day hmm. run, school of fish that came through, you know, everybody's getting excited. Like here, it's here, it's here. You know, it's just kind of like, I think kind of a fluky kind of thing. Ultimate, that's one thing that I always talk about with the month of March in particular is it's a transition period. You know, you have fish trying to come out of a wintertime pattern and get into a spring pattern. And that's what you will see is you will see, for me anyway, inconsistent fishing. You know, when you're trying to do the shallow water thing, you'll you'll catch them one day in a spot and then go back the next day and then poof, they're gone. They either moved on to their next next little haunt that they're going to be in or the water temperature drop just enough to to push them back into deep water or you know the uh the one thing i've been noticing the past really about last seven eight days has been that these huge swings in the tide you know we're like a couple of days you have it where it's two feet high and then the next couple of days you have it where it's two feet low so just the inconsistency of the weather and the water temperature uh it's Spring is almost sprung, but it's not uh, It's not quite there yet. So uh, I'm glad to hear y'all are having some of the same struggles the rest of us are, you know. <laughs> yeah, That's definitely one thing. Not there. Uh, when, uh, talking about your redfish on the beach, I've been doing a little bit of that over my direction over towards Dolphin Island. And, uh, and that's been, that's been a ton of fun. What, what's been, uh, what's been your go-to lure over there? I, I've got one. So they're very hard, like sight fish and redfish is when they're, especially when they're not cruising, if they're just kind of chilling, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's a hard fish to catch. Like, uh, well, at least it is for me, maybe not for you, Richard. I wouldn't, <laughs> I would I wouldn't expect it to be hard for you, but, um, <laughs> I've thrown a lot of things, but, uh, what I've actually had suc- the most success consistently on is, is the salt strong slam shady. If you, it's a little paddle tail, it's like three and a half inch and it's, it's a really good color. I used it a lot fishing the beach for flounder this you know this past summer had a lot of success with that there and i've caught like three sight fished reds now on just that salt strong slam shady off of the beach and anything that i can get a redfish on the beach that's not like super active to eat i feel pretty dang confident in the action and color and presentation of that lure so that's if i see redfish if i'm spotting them that's what i'm probably gonna have tied on yep so, uh, I've had trouble like getting them to, uh, like the other day, I know I was, we were seeing like bigger groups than what you're talking about anywhere from about 15 to 30 fish in a group. Mm. And, uh, and I was throwing like fish bite, uh, like the fight club, you know, mm-hmm. the scented stuff in front of them. And they weren't really keying in on that. And I don't know if it's cause like I, I was getting my jig down on the bottom and kind of twitching it along or whatnot and kind of needed enough weight you know, heavy enough jig head to make a good long cast out there in front mm-hmm. of them. But I tell you, we, uh, I tied on a couple of gut, just old Johnson Sprite gold spoon. Yeah. And, uh, that seemed to be the trick. And I think, and I, and I think what it was is that the cool thing about the spoon is that you can kind of work it up high in the water column and kind of burn it across them. And then they're either going to be real reactive to it or not come up and blast it. Or if they're kind of acting a little screwed up, you know, a little funny, you can slow that thing down and let it flutter Flutter. and then get it even on the bottom, 
you're almost kind of maybe just jigging it a little bit. And I don't know what they think a spoon is. If they think it's like a, uh, a pogey or uh, a menhaden or a, or a fin fish, or if they think it's a crab, because they almost, crab. almost yeah. kind of looks like a crab too, like with yeah. their little swimmers mm-hmm. in the back. So that, that really seemed to be the trick uh, with, some, with some, some of our fish uh, last week, late last week. So that, that spoon was fun, man. I hadn't fished some spoons in, in probably since back in the fall. It's Captain Bobby's go-to for redfish. Oh too. yeah. He likes that spoon. That's yeah. kind of where I learned that trick from, you know, uh, was, uh, it's not was, hard to cast that thing a long ways. Mm-mm. They're, no, they're way pretty good. Uh, yeah. I use, uh, uh, either a half or a three quarter. I think it's a half ounce spoon, man. I feel like I can really, I can throw it cool. as far as a slick lure, yeah. you know, um, it's really far. Yeah, the slicks have been working good for us on the redfish as well, you know. But you would think the jig, like the scented jigs, right. would, yeah, be, would money, be money yeah. in the bank. And uh, yeah. it, it's been tough uh, with, with those. Mm. So, I don't know. I'm always into giving them what they want. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I may have to try the spoon. I've caught one redfish, uh, this was like a couple of years ago, on a gold Johnson spoon. And it was it was cruising. And it was like, it was a really cool experience because it was like almost on the beach. I mean, at the wave even it was real calm but the wave that pushed up that redfish was like almost on dry sand it was so mm-hmm. close to the beach and it was past me and it was going away from me and I, I threw past it and just brought that spoon right by it and it turned around and ate you know i just got to see the whole experience right there off of the beach and it turned around and ate that thing it really cool but I, I haven't used a spoon probably since then so i need to try it again that's one thing i always really enjoy uh this time of year in march is uh is those reds love to get on that beach you know you're and they're not necessarily all bull reds uh they're more like i, I would just say your upper slot like your yeah. 20 24 24 inch would kind of be on the small side but they're you generally not bigger than about 30 32 inches you know you're not usually catching those big 36 44 inch ones uh, mm-hmm. like that but it just amazes me how shallow they want to get on this bar sometimes like they'll literally get up and there'll be a school of 30 of them like in in a foot or uh, in like a foot of water mm-hmm. you know what i mean like shin deep ankle deep water almost and uh they're usually really aggressive that's fun um, it is a lot of fun yeah uh yeah the uh we I, fortunate unfortunately i i didn't see as large of schools as you as you now i'm i was on foot and i think i walked about seven miles the day that I was, that I was walking and looking for these fish. And the one, the one that I actually caught that particular day, I threw it about three or four different schools, but this was the largest school that I saw. And I think it was like five fish. Like that was, and and I've noticed like if there is a school with more fish, you definitely have a better opportunity. (laughs) The the onesie twosies, those are, uh, those are definitely very difficult fish to to get to eat sometimes. Yeah, I think, and I think, and I've seen, I've, I've seen that, that same process happen uh, for me several different times. And I think the thing is, it's like safety and numbers, you know what I mean? When there's, when there's a big group of them milling around, they feel a lot more comfortable out there because you know, heck, uh, the other day we were sight casting. Actually, this day they were kind of spooky um, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, reason. But, you know, just like 100 yards off the beach was a bunch of dolphins cutting up uh, right there. Yeah. And then, you yeah. know, and, and you know those dolphins uh, probably could pick off a, oh, yeah. a redfish fairly easily, you know. Sure. So um, that could have been why they were acting a little mm-hmm. spooky uh, the, the last time I was out there. But uh, definitely when there's a big wad of them, they usually they don't shy away from eating. But when there are kind of like a, a single or a pair or, you can know, be super spooky. Yeah, they can be. So Captain yeah. Richard, when you're talking about sight fishing, these reds from the beach and like Matthew was saying, that's a great point. I mean, Richard's eight feet higher than you, you know yeah. what I mean? As far as seeing stuff on the yeah. bow of that boat. So. Are you looking for anything in particular? Are you looking for deep holes or sandbars or bait? Or are you looking for anything? Or are you just going going to the beach? They definitely do like some contour to the beach. You know, uh, the one a uh, couple of areas I've been in, there's uh, there's little pockets, little holes, and they're usually like, you know, just say there's uh, say there's a bar and there's a hole in between two bars. They're generally going to be right around those two little intersections on the in, on the tips of those bars or right down in that hole. If I can't really see all the way to the bottom of the hole, I usually make a handful of blind cast right in that little area before I keep 
Just cover it all. Yeah, trolling motor and along. But um, I tell you one thing I keep thinking I, to do, but I hadn't done it, is tie a topwater on, mm. you know, and see if they'll come up and eat a topwater because redfish love a topwater and they don't care. Be what, fun. They don't care what time of day it is either, like right. a speckled trout. You know, you can throw a topwater in the middle of the day at a, at a redfish and they'll they'll pick up and blast it. But, you know, a speckled trout, they, they definitely want like some low light conditions seems mm. to be when that's better. Yep. Matthew, uh, kind of getting back on Pompano. Uh, so Pompano, is about to start off is there uh is there anything in particular you're going to kind of be looking for for when uh for when those guys show up as far as like uh maybe picking your spot where you want to start out at are you going to be uh set rig fishing jig fishing natural bait artificial bait all of the above what's uh what's going to kind of be your game plan here in the next couple of weeks yeah, uh, all, definitely all of the above, but it, I gave a big clue already as, as to, to where you, you basically start with these fish. The migratory pattern, they're always going to see them sooner to the east of us. I mean, yeah, that's just go east. His, his, historically the, the case. So, I mean, if you're itching to get on some fish and you're trying to be kind of first to, I mean, we kind of have that first pop of them. I mean, they're around and you can start catching them any day. Like you could be out there and have a really good day. Uh, as long as water conditions are good, but I, I would definitely focus on east. Uh, I usually start out trying to find them and locate them using set rigs and and dead baits, you know, shrimp and ghost shrimp and your synthetics and, uh, you know, just bait and weight. And once I kind of start locating fish and seeing what they like and what areas they're hanging, uh, that's definitely when I take the opportunity if conditions are right to tie on some pompano jigs and walk the beach and throw that or, you know, sometimes they even get stupid and try to take a ladder out to the beach and try to sight fish them if, <laughs> if conditions are right, just doing something different, kind of kind of stupid. But, uh, but yeah, the piers, like I know uh, they also had a really good day the other day. Uh, I think Navarre Pier was was lighting them up pretty good. Pensacola Pier had a really good day. So we haven't seen that, like, really good day in our area on the Alabama coast yet. But it, it's getting there. We're so we're so close. I caught my very first pompano like two days ago this year. First pompano, it was like nine inches maybe, but it was nice. my first one. <laughs> first one. That's and right. uh, anytime you start seeing those small fish, like that's always the precursor to the run. I mean, you're going to see those really tiny fish first I, every year. That's how it's been for me. You see these tiny little fish, you know, showing up about March, and then you know once the uh, larger fish show up, it's it's all. I was looking at the forecast for this weekend. I think we're finally going to have some semi-consistent temperatures, at least. That's got to help everything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been crazy. Like what last? I think it was last Friday. It froze, mm-hmm. and then Monday it was eighty degrees. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's been all over the place. Crazy high, low tide. You know, crazy high tides, crazy low tides. We just need to get some sort of consistency for all all of this fishing to kind of even out a little bit. Yeah, I know one thing I definitely noticed is just as far as our surroundings go, driving around town and, and being out and about, you know, like one crazy thing is like usually, you know, like rule of thumb is uh, when you start seeing the azaleas bloom, it's like time to go sheephead fishing, right? And then you see the dogwoods bloom, like generally like yep. a month later in April, then it's time to go trout fishing or go go chase uh, ling on the beach or whatever, you know, but like this year you have the azaleas and the dogwoods dog woods are blooming, blooming right at, the exact <laughs> same, at the exact same time. So it's like, like I said earlier, you know, about it, it's like all the fishermen are just as confused as the fish and the weather is, you know. So are the trees apparently. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that's what I'm getting at, you know, is everything's a little bit yeah. confused right now. So I think a little bit of consistency to the weather and whatnot is really going to kind of go a long way, you know. Got um, to. Yep. So. Yeah, yep, once for, for Pompano, like if you have a way, I look at an app called Windy and it gives me water temps and stuff. I don't, and you can plug in the area uh, that you want to look for specifically. But, you know, once we start seeing like consistently water temps in, at, at about 68 degrees along the beaches, uh, we've talked about that before, but that yep. that's kind of the target temperature uh, for, for these Pompano. And that's when you will start really seeing those schools hot and heavy yeah that's and that just kind of goes back to what we've been talking about with the inconsistency i've seen Mm -hmm. i've seen water temperatures in the past week anywhere from 58 degrees all the way up to 70 degrees you know what i mean (laughs) you got a 12 12 degrees poor fish i i know you know so that's just it right now uh but uh uh, has there been any any kind of uh consistency to anything else going on out there whiting whiting happening or have you heard a peer report from any of those guys I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I did. Pe- I, f- I even forgot because it's my least favorite style of fishing. Probably, <laughs> probably why? Why not pier fishing, but sheep's head fishing? 
yeah. is my absolute least favorite. And I did I did go to the pier last week and caught some sheep's head. And uh, many people have been catching sheep's head out there on the pier. So it, the sheep's head bite has actually been fairly uh, consistent. So as a land-based angler, if, you, if you're trying to get on anything, you can at least go do that. But e- even the whiting, man, I mean, like, the little bit of set rig fishing that I've been doing, you kind of always bank on, oh, you know, I can probably pick up a few whiting, but uh, on the pier too, this year, we're really weird. Uh, you know, we generally see the really big whiting throughout the winter uh, show up around the pier. And that's when a lot of the guys take their like four pound test, super subtle stuff. And they're fishing with either live shrimp or live ghost shrimp. And, you know, they just, you know, light, light of gear as possible off of the pier. And that's when, and you can almost sight, you pretty much sight fish on these big mm-hmm. whiting. And that, that never happened this year mm. for, for our area. Don't know why. Uh, some, some areas east of here, Navarre, they, had that, they got to experience that. I know there was a lot of reports of this big whiting, same situation there. But for us, don't know why, but that, that never came through for us. Um, I know, uh, I know it seems like it was more back in October, November time frame, right? When they seemed to come back, you know, the, the, the whiting will school up bigger, better on the beaches. It seemed like it was good early. And then I heard kind of the same thing you're talking about, uh, right now, as far as like the wintertime bite, when that's usually something real consistent mm-hmm. was not, you know, so, you know, they didn't really like, you know, we saw them at some point, so it's not like anything's yeah. wrong with the fishery. I don't sure, think, sure. But, no, no, um, no. I, I, I'm not alarmed. I, it's just, it was just kind of odd, like. Mm-hmm. It last several years you know I, I i knew that the you could go to the pier and catch some lighting but th- that just wasn't the case but during the winter too many too many people watching uh bama beach bomb on youtube huh <laughs> <laughs> clean cleaned out the lighting we've oh, uh, decimated the lighting population no <laughs> like way it. no way what well, else we're doing up to good. man what did we miss anything uh I, I, well you know i i've got I don't really have a whole lot of trips coming up. I'm, I'm going in May. Uh, that, that's kind of my next big trip going up to Cape Cod and I'm going to be chasing some stripers. My, my goal for that is to, uh, to catch one with my feet on the sand, <laughs> a striper. Yeah. Which I'm, so I, it's kind of a different thing. And I'm just implanting myself up there. I, I have no Intel. I'm just, you know, researching it myself. I don't, I'm not going to be using a guide or anything, just going, spending a week and hopefully going to find, a fish or two <laughs> that'll be fun i'll be looking forward to hear the results of that hopefully you have yeah. some good luck yeah yeah that's what i like doing man i you know i, I really like winging it uh just going somewhere and figuring it out myself you know i i have connections you know i could i could reach out to people i have people offer all the time and you know i of course could hire a guide and all that but like for me it's just and i feel like for for what i do content wise it just makes it a little more interesting to see me struggle and see me just try to figure it out and go through the process of, you know, using your brain to find fish and figure it out. Yeah. Well, it's always that much more rewarding to, to, uh, to strike gold than it is to, uh, Hey, somebody tell you, Oh, Hey, go dig a hole right over there. And you're going to, uh, you're going to, you're going to get rich, you know, like, I might could do that now. We're talking, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. if we're talking money, you know, right. The fish is a little different than a pot of gold, but, uh, anyway, (laughs) (laughs) oh man, that's a good report. Matthew, if folks want to follow you on the YouTubes or Facebook and all that stuff, what's the best way to get up with you? Yeah. It's Bamba beach bomb. You type it in anywhere on, on the socials. You'll, you'll find me. It's, it's there. That's very widespread. <laughs> That's right. There are pl- plenty of content out there for you. Sweet, we always man. enjoy it as always, man. We look forward to hearing from you next time. Safe travels. All right. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Take a quick break and hear from a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Fishing Chaos. Fishing Chaos recently announced the launch of its new club module and a partnership with National Scouting Report to significantly enhance exposure, recruitment, and scholarship awards for high school anglers. NSR announced last month the addition of fishing to their already successful sports recruiting program. Fishing Chaos invites all high school fishing teams to create a free club on the Fishing Chaos platform. Clubs can hold tournaments within the high school team or invite rival clubs to compete in CPR catch photo release events, as well as live weigh-in events as Fishing Chaos supports most any tournament format. The addition of the new Fishing Chaos Club Management Module allows coaches to easily communicate with the team about upcoming events. It automates the tracking 
of Angler of the Year or Team of the Year standings and collects Angler results. Fishing Chaos will play a key role in recruitment by collecting data on tournament finishes. NSR will build Angler profiles based on these results and other criteria important to college programs. If you're interested in setting up a free team club or a tournament, please contact Fishing Chaos today at fishingchaos.com or call Jesse Wilson at 256-508-1853. And also brought to you by Alabama Marine Resources Division. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest great trigger fish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through snapper check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to snapper check online at outdooralabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about snapper check or any of the fishing seasons, please visit at outdooralabama.com man it's always fun to talk to ultimate man he's uh, never know uh, what that dude's gonna be doing. i know he's a good dude man uh just i i just love following him and watching his story just progress and yep. and flourish and whatnot but uh let's uh i guess we don't know where pat's gonna be but uh never whether know. he's on the eastern shore in the gulf of mexico or uh over here in our waters over here in our waters <laughs> and uh on the west side but uh how are we doing today patrick garmerson doing uh doing well doing well uh always always nice to get out there and have a have a guide trip have some happy customers uh, especially when it's uh when it's a little bit of a little bit of a struggle bus bite but i was off the boat pretty uh pretty excited about their next trip down to our area from indiana so i guess that's all i can hope for as a as a fishing guide is folks an- anxious to get back for next year that's right. It's funny you say that. We were recording a hunting land podcast earlier and we were talking to a guy that connects hunters to outfitters. He's like the middleman. Mm-hmm. And that's what we were talking about, man. You, you can help a lot of things, especially as a guide, but necessarily, you know, the, the fishing and the hunting isn't necessarily going to be jam up all the time, but that's all right. the other things in between are what makes a good guide, a good guide, that's you know, you have happy people, you're busting your butt. You're trying everything that you can. And sometimes they just don't cooperate. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, talking to you earlier, sounds like you had a tough trip of a, a day, a tough trip today. Um, I've also had a couple of those here, here recently. And I, I just, to me, it's just one of those functions of, uh, the transition period we're in right now. Um, I know just on my end, I've seen, uh, within the past week, uh, or maybe week and a half, I've seen water, uh, water be a foot to two feet low. And then I've seen it be two feet high, you know, and then we've had these, uh, maybe 12 degrees of temperature swing in a, in a span of a couple of days, you know, you're seeing water temperature sometimes that are like in the upper fifties, lower sixties, all the way up to 70 degrees, you know? And so, uh, I feel like the fish mm-hmm. are just struggling to find comfort, whatnot, not to mention all these crazy different wind directions that we're getting, you know, you had all that Southeast yesterday, big hard West wind today. Um, who knows what we'll be doing tomorrow and the rest of the week, but, uh, kind of looking long range looking long range it looks like things are maybe going to kind of stabilize a little bit which uh i think i think that's really all we need is just a little bit of stability with uh with as far as the temperature and whatnot goes yeah absolutely every time every time we've kind of uh gotten through one of these miniature hurricanes that come through (laughs) (laughs) you know it seems like a day or two later it'll things will things will kind of level out and fish cooperate a little better but generally if i've been able to find some pretty good quality water that hadn't been just like four foot seas the day before i seem to find be able to find the bite but it seemed like today like you said it went from like south southeast and the only the only refuge i had was either to get into the rivers or or a canal or something like that or fish the western side of the bay and i did a little bit of all of that kind of felt like the canal was going to be going to be my savior and the water looked good in there but man we we just couldn't get anything going in there so then i pulled out and got into the bay and the water was not not what i would say ideal but we did um I mean, we got a few, uh, got a few puppy drum out of the mix. I mean, no redfish bites, no sheephead bites. Saw a couple of slicks pop up, and I, I threw a, a slick lure in in the area while they were throwing popping corks, and I had one like pull, like it didn't bite it, it just like pulled the lure, and I was like, hey, I'll throw over there, and 
nothing happened but yeah it's uh it's it's been pretty consistently inconsistent for me where <laughs> when it yeah, goes that's a great way to put it right <laughs> yeah. when when it goes uh when when this wind and everything just gets really churned up man it just is like just pull your hair out trying to figure something out and then like with what we had go through last night i mean i don't know how bad it rained around y'all but it rained pretty good in daphne and it you know the rivers and all got pretty beat up from all that rain and it's like that's not a good option and then the bay's all beat up so uh one of my customers hit me up this morning he was headed out and uh said he would said he'd report back if uh if he got on something and he reported back a zero when he was putting a boat on the trailer so Mm, dang you know, misery loves company on some of these days. You know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> I, I, and I tell you, uh, today's conditions right behind that, that big front. It, and, and I see this in the wintertime a lot behind all the fronts. The day after a front to me is the absolute toughest day to fish is when you have these big weather swings. You know, we probably had some low pressure yesterday kind of building and then you have the front come through and have a bluebird day like that. And then the, um, the, the pressure comes back up and that change has got to be tough on them. Yeah, it's gotta be, but on the, on the lighter side and on the positive note, um, positive when I've been able to get out and (laughs) I don't like, I don't like digging into the, into the doldrums of, of fishing. So the positive side of things is when I've been able to, uh, slip out in the front and get out in the golf the uh the sheephead bite has been has been really really good and i've um i would say that right now it's in the it's in the catching like when we're leaving the dock and we can get out there i'm telling folks we're going to be going catching we're not going fishing so it's uh it, it's pretty instantaneous once you mark those fish around around the platforms or near shore structures and you you're you're marking them pretty heavy i've found that kind of my sweet spot is at say 10 feet deep down to maybe uh 20 um is like and that's that seems to be where a lot of the fish are hanging and then one of the one of the things i have noticed is that if there's a bunch of spade fish chewing you up in that shallower range go a little bit deeper and see if there's some sheep head down below the the spade a lot of like really small like hand-sized spade fish that are like piranhas on your shrimp and they just peck <laughs> it to death like in just a few seconds so you kind of once you once you drop a few times and you kind of d- identify that your bite isn't a sheephead bite try dropping it on, on down a little bit further and if it's still spade fish just just move to a different section of the rig or or move to an or move to another rig altogether is what i ended up doing uh the other day where we pulled up uh to to one of the platforms that was that was doing well for us on like Thursday or Friday or whatever day it was and went back and got them pretty good the next time. And then the next time after that, it was, it was a lot of spade fish. So we moved, moved to a different platform and, and just started whacking them again. So anyway, it's been a, it's that, that part of it's been really fun. Yep. Um, and then um, I, uh, I've, I've experienced the same thing. Um, you know, on these, on these nicer days, when you can get out, when you get out there, it's on fire and heck, you'd really, really don't even need live, live shrimp to a degree. You know, I was, mm-hmm. I was putting the dead ones on in the live well that were kind of even maybe pink from the day before, you know, and they were chewing those up too. So, um, mm-hmm. so that's been good. Yeah. I, I was on the way to the Island and nobody had live bait on the way down and I stopped it hooked up and snagged. They have, they have these, uh, frozen shrimp packs and, I was like, well, this will be better than nothing. And heck, it was nice. I just opened one up and threw it on the front deck and opened one up and threw it on the back deck. And they went to, they just take a shrimp out and break it in half, put it on the hook. I just told them like, hey, just just use just enough shrimp to cover the hook. And that's all you need. And, and they were, they they showed no resistance to the, uh, to the fresh frozen shrimp at all. Heck yeah. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's, a good thing. that's a good thing right now. For sure, man. I know we've talked about um, it before, but it's probably been a while. It was probably last year about this time whenever we talked about your your rigging for those. Just kind of walk us through your ideal setup on your rigging for those sheep's head. Man, I like to try to keep it as simple and as lightweight as possible. I go with the braid to my um, monofilament 20-pound leader, and I use a one-aught or even a two-aught 
a kale hook. And I find that using like the two all with these big, like when you're around a lot of these bigger fish, when they're, there's a lot of them that are say five pounds or up to nine, 10, 11 pounds, having a bigger hook is not a bad thing. And that big, that kale hook, it, when it sets properly, it will, that gap in that hook will wrap around that fish's jaw and just is like locked in place. It's, it's almost locked in there so good that it's a nuisance to get it out of the fish, to get it unhooked, to, to, um, to go to fishing again. But it really locks in there. And, um, and it's, and it's all about having that gap in that hook. And then that two alt has a little bit longer shank to be able to be able to actually unhook the fish. They're not leader. They're not really hook shy and leader shy at all. What, what, when they're feeding like this. And then I like to use a split shot or maybe two, if I just need to add a little bit more weight, but ideally I like for it to just sink slowly through the water column because there's a lot of fish that'll be hanging up high and some of those fish that are up higher can be a lot of your bigger ones especially this time of the year so i like to sink it slow but if it's windy or if you got a little bit of current just just kind of play to what you need to where it's not just drifting way out off the um drifting way off from where you're where you're trying to fish sometimes having a lighter leader or a lighter uh weight will allow say if you're tied up so, so like the, we had a setup the other day where the winds were out of the east but the current was going west to east having a lighter rig was that the, the current was actually pulling was actually pulling our bait closer to the platform and the and the structure there uh versus um if we would have been using say like a a one ounce sinker or something just because we wanted to use something heavy the current wasn't strong enough to have pulled something that heavy closer to the structure where the fish were so that's another advantage to having that lighter weight but i don't know what the size like i i when i buy split shots i usually i'm just buying them at the bait shop and i say hey give me uh give me like uh two packs of every size and i just <laughs> whichever works and i just uh i just start playing around with it till i find one that works and and some of my some of my customers are way more sensitive to being able to feel the bite and and I'll go even lighter with them and the ones that can't really sense that bite or really feel the bait and feel what's going on I'll go a little bit heavier with them so there may be a little inconsistency from one rod to the next on my boat but it's really based upon how my anglers are are feeling the bite and feeling the uh feeling the shrimp down there I really like what you were just talking about uh, with your hook selection there, using that kale hook and, and even going a little bit bigger because that kale, you're exactly spot on with what I see and experience as well, that it always seems to get right there in that corner behind the jawbone and you really don't get that many the many pulled hooks if they get the hook down in their mouth you know of course you reel them up sometimes and they're hooked real superficially or whatnot, mm -hmm. but I really like that kale mm -hmm. and I, I tell you, I don't know why, but back in the day i used to just use like the same hook i would use from speckled trout which is like a number eight treble you know and uh man it seemed like i used to pull fish off and pull fish off one after another and then mm -hmm. one day i tied mm -hmm. on a uh, uh you know like a live bait j or a kale and uh hook ratio went through the roof not to mention i wasn't having a uh, reeling up uh squished up treble hooks from yeah. uh <laughs> yep. from those crushers sheets. they will they yeah. will flatten they will flatten that treble hook i uh, know man it's a it's amazing I tell you yep. what, I saw, I saw something pretty interest, interesting the other day, uh, uh, last week, kind of right when this, uh, sh you know, the sheep had kind of started to show up and, um, I think you and I both went out there on the same day and you'd had a real good morning and I kind of had a little bit of a struggle with it and I was getting eat up on live shrimp by bluefish, <laughs> um, which is kind of mm -hmm. a strange species to think about, uh, being around this time of year. And, uh, Patrick, uh, to a T guessed exactly which rig I was at, you know, he's like, Oh yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that one over there, it got the bluefish on it, you know, but, uh, huh. one thing I did pick up, uh, was there was another, another guide boat out there, um, that I saw and, I just got, we were close enough. I could hear them talking and they were using crabs, fiddler crabs. Yeah. And they were catching those sheep that pretty good. And we were getting a sheep head, you know, about every fifth or sixth bluefish, you know, and, uh, it makes sense. I guess that the bluefish were leaving the crabs alone and on the shrimp, 
Hmm. Um, and that, so that was kind mm-hmm. of a, a little bit of a way to combat that. I thought that was really interesting. I don't know who that guy was. I've seen him around and whatnot, but, uh, but anywho, that was, uh, that was pretty interesting, interesting little trick there, you know, maybe for some of our, uh, listeners yeah, that's to a great pick tip. up on. Yeah. If you can get, cause it, if you go to that one bluefish rig. Yeah. Yeah. If you end up at the bluefish rig, you'll, <laughs> you'll know, know, you'll, you'll know, know when you get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, blew, I blew through a 25 pack of hooks like i was going you know like just i was might standing, as well throw it over yeah, there I just throw shit, exactly so dumped them out of the pack <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> you got it right on the on the crabs though if, if i would say if anybody is just like man i want to make it just the absolute best case scenario uh having different baits i mean what i used to we we would go like if my well my dad would take us out we knew we were gonna like daylight to dark it on sheephead man we would we would go scour the the east end jetties for hermit crabs and we'd be out there digging up fiddler crabs and freaking scraping oysters off the off the sea walls and whatever else and i mean when we went sheephead fishing we had we would have like five or six different bait types and uh they were it, it was and it would be often that one bait would stand out from the rest it could have been could have been oysters it could have been the hermit crabs it could have been fiddler crabs but that was always that was always our mission whenever we were going after them like just you know hell or high water sun up to sun down kind of fishing so definitely if somebody's going to just try to set in and make a day of it having a having a bunch of bait and it and what it'll do is it'll kind of help you from having to do a bunch of running around like i was mentioning about pulling up here and spade fish were tearing me up well if you had and and you had the blue fish thing if you had crab you'd be able to slide by those fish a lot quicker and easier and probably just be able to stay in the same spot keep catching your sheephead yep. that's great advice man since we're diving down on these uh diving down deep on these lamb noggins you said something a minute ago that sparked interest in my brain talking about seeing those bigger fish up top sometimes, or, you know, letting it float down past those bigger fish. Whenever you're setting up on a rig, are you trying to focus on the up current side, the down current side, or are you just using your electronics circling this rig, trying to find those fish or how are you trying to, or how, how are you pinpointing those sheep? A lot of it is visual at first. So if there's nobody on a, if there's nobody on a rig, I'm going to, pull up there and make a full circle around all the structures using side vision, down vision, and I'm going to be looking into the water uh, with my eyes as well. So I'm going to be looking down, looking back at the machine, looking down, looking back at the machine until I'm either seeing fish flashing and, and swimming on the surface really good, or I'm seeing some good marks that are generally, like I said earlier, I want to try to find them where they're hanging, say, 20 feet and shallower this time of year in particular and then when you when you go around a portion of the rig and you look down and you see three of them over there on a pile and, and you look at your machine and it looks like it, it looks like a school of pogies down there it's like all right yeah this is the right spot and then then i just take and see how my setup is sometimes getting around those platforms with a trolling motor at least in my experience, there's sometimes where they can get to wandering really bad on you because if you're if you're trying to hold really close to the rig, you'll hit that anchor mode and it'll be fine and dandy, and all of a sudden it goes to taking off and <laughs> about to crash you into the rig and stuff like that. So a lot of times I I like to try to set up where I can just tie up to the rig and allow that and just and just be able to tie up instead of relying on the trolling motor. But if I ran around and I found the school of fish was was up current or up wind, then and I can set the boat out where the trolling motor is going to behave properly. Then I'll just use then I'll be using the trolling motor, or if somebody's dropping anchor or whatever. But I mean that's it. I mean when I that that's exactly the process that I use to decide on how I'm going to fish. And it's not it, there's not a cut and dry pull up to this spot and do this every time. It's just not that it's not that easy. Yeah, I'm with you on the uh, on the trolling motor deal uh, out there around those platforms can be, especially can be, if there's any little swell at all. Yeah, it can be a little bit tricky, especially getting as close as you need to get to make a good presentation to the fish, you know, without having the wind or the current just sweep your bait away from those rig legs. One thing I've noticed, you know, uh, with the trolling motor deal is 
my trolling motor likes to have a, a more southern view of the sky. Those you rigs know? will block that spotlight. Yep. And if you're on like the north side of those rigs, you've got, you know, some of that metal coming up, uh, kind of blocking that that little slight southern view to the sky for whatever reason that seems to be when makes it all wonky. Yeah, when my uh when my trolling motor wants to act up. So for whatever uh-huh. that's worth, I've uh, I've definitely found myself tying up to them more and trying to figure out a way to do it that way, you know, and that, that's the one thing too, you know, like kind of look at this a little bit, uh, two different ways, a bigger, a bigger structure, you have more tie up points to where you can kind of set yourself up better to get your baits presented uh-huh. better. Uh, but the smaller, the smaller platforms yeah. are usually generally speaking, getting fished less, there's less pressure. So it seems like sometimes the bites a lot better at some of those little bit smaller places and heck, even some of those little pencil, you know, like one, it's really three legs going down, but it's only one, one standing up. Sometimes those things are money in the bank, you know, cause people ride by and I'm like, why would I go fish that little bitty thing over Probably there? Go fish you know? this big giant one over yeah, here. Yeah. I'm going to fish this great big one over here, you know, but sometimes those are the money spots. Cause like I said, that's kind of everybody's mindset to a degree. Patrick, yep. uh, have, uh, have you been doing anything on redfish or have you, uh, have you seen as far as our, uh, this, this big bull red kill that we've kind of seen happen? Um, I know I've been catching, well, catching some reds, but of course we just had this big kill. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I know everybody's kind of dying uh, and itching to hear about it. Yeah. So just prior to those fish starting to pop up, I had a, I had a really, really good trip in the bay where we found, we found some bull reds, uh, feeding on the surface not like this big giant school like just dixie bar style but they were there and we were able to keep circling around and catching them up until that point red fishing had been pretty good to to a degree i mean there were some days where we were having to really work for two or three uh really felt like it was more work than it was worth overall the red fishing has been a little bit funky and a little slower for me this spring and then we saw a few fish uh, around Dolphin Island uh, the other day, and they weren't acting great. Like seemed a little off as far as when we cast to them. There was only, there'd only be like one that was interested in eating. But as far as the as far as the the uh, redfish kill or whatever's going on, um, I've seen it several years in the past, and and I've had I've seen it happen more so in like April. But it always seemed to be like when the rivers are just staying high in the spring. When that Tom Big B and Alabama River are staying really high and in the flood stage or near flood stage, just pumping just way more fresh water than we're used to into the bay, it seems like that's when those uh, die-offs occur. And I've talked to some of our marine resources biologists, and I've heard them kind of theorize that it could be maybe some sort of freshwater born bacteria or something to that effect. But the, you know, the, the interesting thing is that it's bull reds and bull reds only out there floating around. And the last few times I've seen it, when I was trying to catch redfish, I felt like even the smaller redfish may have been affected as well. Like my redfish bite just was really really tough for a couple of weeks during whenever I, we were seeing a lot of those dead fish around so that's that's about all i know uh, other than you know it, it's sad i mean every we were we were way further up into the bay today and saw bull reds and my customer i was talking to said that they fished other parts of mobile bay today and saw bull reds dead all over the place so i mean it's thousands of fish by the by by all accounts of you know of the different reports we're hearing i mean that's a that's a lot of stock being uh, eliminated what have you heard richard man uh well just you know so crystal hightower and i had a long conversation uh yesterday about all this and uh she's got some ideas about trying to figure out in the future why these fish have died you know which really entails uh kind of having some watchdogs having some people uh looking to find one that's either dying or kind of acting mm-hmm. funky or something like that to either get a live fish or a fresh dead one in there to go and and do some uh some different tests on them to try to you know kind of put their finger right on what why that fish what, what the mortality of that fish was this event like you know like you said it's sad to see and uh it's terrible you know but I, it seems like literally every year 
in the spring, sometimes, you know, you had said something about April and I already kind of feel like it's April weather almost to a degree, you know, but every time this time of year, we see a, a, a bull red kill, but it's like you said earlier, usually it seems like there's some catfish mixed in with it too. You know, you'll see all the catfish kind of die and some bull reds die. Mm-hmm. But right now it only seems like bull reds and it only seems like the same size fish, you know, they Which all, is interesting. They are, and it's kind of, yeah. and it's kind of a widespread deal. You know, we're seeing them in the Gulf, seeing them up in the Bay, seeing them in uh, Mississippi Sound, over there on the Eastern Shore, Fort Morgan, it's Dolphin kind of, Island. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of a little bit all over the place. So, who knows exactly? There was a bunch of theories as to what that was, but no algae bloom, right? I heard no, that that yeah. could have been an algae bloom, but yeah. they ruled that out. Yep, yeah, that's right. And uh, dissolved oxygen is good. We've had plenty of wind and tide movement and uh things of that nature uh hasn't been a significant uh temperature drop to kill any fish uh there's a lot of other fish i would think would die to a temperature issue than a than a, than a redfish they seem like yeah, it seems to be very specific that's right so who the heck knows yeah. what's going on with them there's a bunch of theories floating around out there but none of them are alarming no uh, not at the moment what you said richard the watchdog that is definitely one of the things that some of the biologists i've talked to said that if if we could start trying to get a little bit of an idea of what's happening is would be if somebody was to come up on a redfish that was dying like if it was if it was swimming weird coming into the surface rolling up you know any type of dying look about it it would be it would behoove whoever finds it to to pick that thing up call marine resources and freaking put it in a live well try to keep it alive and try to get it to the biologist while it's still alive or or nearly you know or or recently dead that could really go a long ways because once those fish die they're starting their bodies start to degrade almost instantly so then it probably eliminates the eliminates the pathogen that calls the live fish to there to die so the autopsy process is pretty much compromised once the fish is totally dead and there's no way to sample anything off of live tissue well maybe with all our listeners and you guys out there all day maybe we can uh maybe we can get one yep uh, keep your eyes out yep crystal high tower was very uh she's trying to head up a plan to uh to possibly put you know like a, a watchdog group together you know specifically probably some of the guides who are out on the water the the most amount you know to pick up one of these fish and and try to get it to her some which way while it was you know like what patrick was saying either still somewhat alive and trying to live or or uh whether it dies small window or whatnot yeah uh just just try to try to as quickly as possible get get in touch with one of those kind of folks to to get it in so who the heck knows but like i said it's kind of a cyclical thing it's been happening every year on some scale um this is probably on one of the higher end ones that i've uh witnessed of course i haven't seen a whole lot of these fish with my own two eyes um i just haven't been bumping into one of those right tide lines full of them but i've seen plenty of the videos going on plenty of the fish washed up on the beach and whatnot so i know the degree that it's that it's happening at and kind of to patrick's point too about being on a few of these reds and kind of having a couple of them act funny i I saw the same thing, you know, I caught them like real good late last week, one day, like where they chewed the rod tips off and then came back to the same school of fish kind of had a little bit of trouble kind of getting them to eat every once in a while, or they were just super spooky. I, who knows what this way, the weather has been right. Hard kinda, to pinpoint uh, it. It's kind of changing. They didn't really seem real apt to chew. They did one day. And then the, you know, the next two days I looked at the same school, they were kind of acting a little funny, you know? So who the heck knows, but I think it'll come back on around once this weather stabilizes a little bit. And hopefully, uh, you know, we just had all that Southeast wind, maybe blew some good water in here, help clean things up a little bit. Yep. Sometimes we mother nature has a way of, uh, kind of hitting the reset button. So, yeah, yep. hopefully yeah, that's uh, funny. Uh, that's uh, funny. You said something about Mother Nature. I saw somebody on one of the groups post, uh, "Who's going to clean up all the dead redfish on uh, on the beaches at Dolphin Island?" And I wanted to put so bad on there. Mother Nature usually takes care of that, you know. Yep. <laughs> crabs yeah. and uh, crabs and birds and yep. uh, circle of life. Yeah, ants and whoever you know <laughs> usually take care of that for us. But you know, definitely. Well, that's a great report, Captain Patrick. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Uglyfishing.com. They can go there. Check out my calendar. It's live. It's filling up. I did just have a, a, a date 
we moved a little further into the summer. March 31st just opened up, so I got that date and a couple couple days in April and May still remain. Um, but June and July is kind of where a lot of my people are looking on the calendar. Um, you can go there, check out any of my social media links on there, or give me a call or shoot me a text at 251-747-1554. Awesome, buddy. We appreciate the report. Be safe out there, man. Keep whacking them. We look forward to talking with you next time. Thank you, Butch. See you, Richard. All right, bud. Well, that was another awesome report, and it was brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants and can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also brought to you by the Hunting Exchange. In this day and age, we all know it's a struggle to sell hunting equipment on a large social media platform. And that's where the Hunting Exchange steps in. Hunting Exchange is an app for iOS and Android that gives you a one-stop shop to buy and sell your hunting gear. Whether you're looking to sell your bow, broadheads, technical apparel, stands, saddles, or anything in between, this secure platform allows you to buy and sell gear with confidence. As a buyer, each dollar you spend is insured by PayPal, and as a seller, there are no hidden charges like other platforms and listing items is also free. Gone are the days of having listings removed from Facebook and worrying about being banned and removed from groups for wanting to sell something as simple as your bow or knives. So head on over to the App Store or Google Play and experience a new hassle-free way to buy and sell hunting gear by downloading the Hunting Exchange app today. And also, CCA Alabama. A great way to support conservation projects like the Claude Petit Flounder and Speckled Trout Hatchery in the University of South Alabama Cobia Tagging Project is through the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama Saltwater Fishing License Plate. You guys head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's Distinctive License Plate page at revenue.gov to get yours. All right, Captain Richard, let's head on down and get our last report, but certainly not the least report of the day. Let's see what Captain Dustin Bedgood's up to with Fairhope Fish House. Welcome back to the show, Captain Dustin. How are we doing, buddy? All good, guys. How are y'all? All right, not too bad. Can't complain. This will be about the only captain give me a run for my money on my beard game, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it trimmed up a little bit right now. I'll uh, I I can't get I can't shave it off. Yeah, my, mine's trimmed up a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, uh, the last time I shaved it off, I didn't catch as many fish. So. I know, dude. I, I always feel like that's the damn thing for sure. I trim mine up. I, I have to draw the line, man. Whenever I uh, whenever it gets long to wear, like it. When I'm running along in the uh, bay boat at 50 miles an hour, it starts blowing up in my mouth a little bit, and I'm kind of chewing on my beard. I was like, "Oh, I got this. This is about time for a little trim, you know." But yeah, uh, but, I would. I let mine get long because my wife never complains about it. So you know, there you go. It, it really doesn't. It, I don't. I don't ever think about it for a while until it starts doing it like you're saying and getting in my way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we get to the fishing report, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do with uh, with Fairhope Fish House over there and how uh, how you guys go about doing things. Yeah, we, uh, you know, me and my, my business partner, Jake, we uh, saw a need, what needed to be changed in the fish business. There's a lot of dishonesty, uh, a lot of, you know, fish that get sold. It's not what it says it is or where it comes from. A lot of foreign fish is sold and, as domestic fish. And we just saw a need to change because we, our, you know, locally, if you catch a fish and take it to a fish house, they don't give you anything for it. It's just they're, they don't give you anything for it. There's not a lot of value in it because customers they'll pay the same for a frozen imported fish as they will a local caught fish and so we just felt like there was needed to be a change and you know we we started our business and you know grew it and have grown it to you know serve a bunch of local restaurants and all kinds of local chefs that we sell in new orleans and we're getting into shipping fish all over the place now just to expand our market without having to Uh, because there's a lot of uh, beef companies and stuff that they ship uh, overnight Um, and we're just gonna we're gonna kind of mimic that and do the same thing yep i um i saw one of those beef companies you're talking about that's out of new york i forget what the name of it was called uh something loray frida or something like that and it was yeah that's right i I looked it up and uh it's pretty cool what they're doing that they they actually do ship Mm -hmm. it to you fresh never been frozen I was, beef I was listening to Hank Shaw's podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe and I were guests on his show not too, too long ago. And one of his sponsors is a, is a, I'm pretty sure I don't want to misspeak, but I'm pretty sure it's a salmon company where they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. They'll overnight it. Oh yeah. There's a core. big salmon company that it does that. And there's a, there's a few other companies that do it. 
Uh, I think it's really cool what you guys do, how, you know, you're obviously over there on, uh, on y'all side, uh, you, you have uh, set hours that you're open that you can have walk-in business. And then you also have a delivery set up and man, the really cool part about it to me, man, is that for folks who don't have the means to go out there and get one of these species of fish, you know, you're getting it basically right out of our own backyard and, and, and bringing it to people's homes. Cause where we live, it is ridiculous to get something imported, you know, but yeah. It is hard to find good it local is. stuff. And when Dustin was kind of talking about not necessarily knowing what kind of fish you're getting and all that, I don't know if anybody's seen Sea Spiracy on uh, on Netflix or whatever. But man, you watch that that documentary, make you think twice about uh, yeah, buying that you, chunk at the market. Yeah, man, golly, it's wild what goes into some of this. You know, there's like people who are like sold into slavery and stuff like overseas. There's Chinese boats that go out and fish for six months at a time. Yeah, and catch fish and fill that boat up and they have other boats that come out to them and they offload to them and those fish are just months old they process them and then send them all over the place and there's people that eat them and they think it's the same thing yeah and honestly we get told sometimes that the it, what it is is they gas it with carbon monoxide to make it look that that, that perfect color mm-hmm. yeah um, i've seen some of that yeah, on the facebook page me too that was eye opening really eye opening yeah when they gas it, it it changes it dustin i've seen you also with some of your tuna before uh do where you uh you run the wire down the uh down the uh with jimmy yeah what what is it called yeah yeah okay yeah you do that to all your fish or um we do that to, i don't so i don't do it to the swordfish because i kill them a little differently i bleed them i, I hadn't really tried to do it on them but everything else i mean every it, literally everything else you can do it to down to a beeline okay and it, it really makes a difference, especially if you're trying to get a long time. It's like if you're trying to get that fish to last and keep the freshness for a long time, it makes the most difference. Yep. AFCO just put out a bunch of uh, information on that to where they're selling some of those mm-hmm. wa- those kill wires and whatnot. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, they sell the kit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, man, I, I nerded out on it for like 30 It makes mi- a big difference. 30 minutes watching all the videos and reading up on it, man. It really makes a lot of sense what they're talking uh, about, you know, yeah. shutting down that electrical system, the nervous the system, yeah, nervous system in the fish and whatnot, man. And uh, that's a really, really neat way. And, and, you know, if you want to like get into ethical, like taking of something, man, you're like, you're, you're kind of taking the fish's life right then and there and then letting it bleed out and all that. It's a really, really, uh, really cool deal. Uh, well, enough about all about all that tell us about some fishing man what you, what you've been getting uh here recently man i've been i've been sword fishing mostly doing a lot of nighttime fishing and and you know and daytime the the last trip i went on was a really good bite it was on the moon and we caught several fish that night and then the next morning uh right there you know before lunch we went through a stretch we caught four or five fish in wow. an hour and a half one of them was you know around 200 maybe 215 i didn't weigh the whole fish we just weighed the cores or whatever but um it was it, the bite got real hot and it was on it was on fire i didn't have any baits rigged i would drop we, we caught a fish i rigged a bait dropped back down and within probably five minutes of landing the first fish in the boat i had rigged a squid and we were back down and tight wow it's just, they were just, they were chewing. And if you can get the baits back down there to them, they'll keep eating. And we were fishing multiple lines. And so that helps you keep a bait down also. You know, the fishing multiple lines definitely, you know, improves your chances with those fish because the more baits you got down when they start biting, the better chances you're going to have until you, you know, get doubled up and then you got a lot of confusion going on, but it's fun. You mentioned fishing the moon um, and that being an incredible trip. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you attribute mm-hmm. that trip to? And did y'all specifically you know go out that night because of a certain condition or was it just a weather window why do you think that trip was so hot it was because of the moon i mean that's why i was there i mean i've been waiting for this moon i mean since you know a couple of full moons ago like i when there's certain moons now that uh it's not necessarily on the full moon it could be you know a night or so before but if everything lines up i'm gonna be there even if it's rough because i mean recently you know at, at night especially that night bite's real good i mean you can you, you can be ready with we so with the we're also with the fish house we're, we're fishing some buoy gear it's hand line gear so you hand line the fish mm-hmm. and you know i can put out 10 baits and on the moon, all 10 baits will be tore up before I can get back and check the other one. Wow. You may not catch those fish, but you can tell that that fish was there, you know, hit, he was there. You know, it's just, you didn't, you didn't hook him, but, uh, they just, they're really active on that moon and they come up shallower 
and what I think. That's interesting. I uh, I remember having uh, Angelo Depot on here. He he uh, he's done a lot of sword fishing over the years, and uh, he was kind of mm-hmm. talking about one thing he likes to do on the full moon is set his baits a little deeper because that light transmits mm-hmm. through the through the through the water column a lot deeper, you know. So like just on say like a new moon phase, he'll fish them like you know two fifty three hundred and shallower, and then fish as deep as five five hundred feet like on a on a on a full moon and whatnot. So that's interesting. You uh you like it a little bit a little higher up the water column for on that moon. And it's probably a little different than rod and reel fishing because I'll also, while I have, while I'm fishing the buoys, I'll have the rod and reel fishing out too. And I'll, I'll be fishing those, you know, a little deeper. Um, but you know, I just had this conversation with somebody, you know, I think we catch a lot of small fish at night too. I think that, I think that I should always be fishing. I should always be fishing deep even at night. Because it it just makes sense that those fish are still, they're still down there eating. It's not like they quit eating down deep. Mm-hmm. right if they're if they're if they're biting like that in the daytime down deep they're still gonna be down there at night biting i think right you know and most people are not fishing down that deep at night that's cool uh before uh before we jumped on recording here we were uh we were chit-chatting ahead and uh you said something about fishing some new areas maybe give folks an idea of uh of maybe something you look for as far as going and finding a new area everybody kind of knows the hot spots you know like the ditch and the spur over there off De- Destin and yeah and then some of that stuff that's back to the west but uh but it, you know maybe maybe give folks an idea of something to you know as far as finding a new area what you're looking for you know are you fishing for w- looking for water depth or just a little bit of bottom a uh, little bit of bottom detail there using electronics at all as far that, as you're uh looking around yeah i'm definitely use always using the electronics looking for bait looking for you know any kind of change on the bottom but it also seems that because really i i you know i used to fish at the you know the places where everybody fishes and you know i'd sit out there i could sit out there all day by myself literally nobody people would go by you know every once in a while somebody would be around there fishing mostly people just there up the you know up shallower you know bottom fishing not a lot of people around now of course it's grown a lot and there's people everywhere at those typical spots on some of these summer days especially and i you know i i just decided that on them on them same days i'm just gonna get up in there and fish beside them and then on the days when nobody's out there i'm gonna go to my new spot yeah um so i don't have to worry about anybody seeing me yeah Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I, I don't think that it's a bad thing that there's a lot more people getting into it. I don't have a problem with it being people there. I just, you know, uh, everybody, it's so hard for people to go out there and to go somewhere besides those known spots. For sure. It, they just feel like, you know, I'm going out there. I got to go to where everybody else is going and getting them. I get a little bit of gratification out of catching them when there's nobody around. Definitely. There's a, but there's a lot of areas. I mean, it, it, all you really got to do, I think, is just think about the depth that you're catching those fish at in the known spots and just kind of start exploring. I mean, we got a lot of area that, you know, it fall, eventually it falls off in that same depth range all along the shelf. Right. And, you know, most people are depend, are so dependent upon these mapping systems that that's the only places they're going to fish is where that map tells them to. Yep. Instead um, of like paying and there's, to your um, electronics when you're when you're when you're transiting or something like that. Oh yeah, I mean just and I and also at, at night a lot of times I just kind of if I don't if, it, if we're not fishing a certain thing I just kind of cruise around areas and just let the boat ride and we just watch the electronics at a slow speed and just kind of look and just see what I see um, in certain places and it really doesn't take a whole lot to hold those fish. Mm-hmm. You talking about as far as like really, a, I think about uh, is, structure is, as far as like a contour on the bottom? Yeah, just a contour on the bottom, a edge, any kind of you know a hump, any kind of hump on the bottom where the current, uh, where the current breaks over it or something. I mean, it doesn't take much, and there'll be fish there. But also, all these, you know, I think all these shelf rigs for sure, they, they those short fish are going to be close to them because they're going to be feeding around that around that rig. It, those rigs hold everything. They don't just hold the. If the sharks and stuff are there, the swordfish are the swordfish are probably there too. Yep, I agree um, with that. They're not worried about them sharks. They'll get up in there and eat with them. If there's food there, they're gonna be there probably eat. You may not be able to catch them because of all the sharks. That's what we run into a lot at night. We catch a bunch of sharks. 
Yeah, um, I'm sure. There's plenty especially of those. Especially closer to the rigs. Oh yeah, no shortage of the sharks. But I think I I don't I think there's a lot more places to fish, you know, than people. I, I, who knows? It, we may not. There's so many places out deeper too. We're all fishing in the same depth of water. You know, the deeper you go and the deeper you fish. Even when I go out deep and fish, I'm still fishing in the same water column. Right. Um, I'm still only fishing a certain depth. I'm not I'm not exploring anything deeper. Um, just because you don't want to be sitting out there fishing somewhere where there may not be any fish and you're not willing to wait for that bite. But you're right. There's a lot of golf out there. Mm-hmm. Golly, it's, There's a lot it's, of it. <laughs> it's very expansive. There's very few people getting that far out all the time. You know what I mean? That are, that are willing oh, to yeah. go do like kind of what you're talking about. Search doing, and destroy. You know? so, yeah. Yeah. Getting out there and looking around yeah, doing their sure. homework and spending a lot of time out there to find these certain types of contours and whatnot. When you're talking about, uh, like a, like a finding a bump or a, uh, a contour or something like that, what, 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 what's, what's, what are you looking for as far as like, uh, the most bottom relief, like is 50 foot a lot for you, or is it more like a hundred foot? Um, as far as, as far as a contour change. I haven't found a whole lot of places where there's a contour change of like of a drastic change of a hundred foot. Mm-hmm. Uh, most all of them are less than that. Okay. Or they're, they're gradual. Most of them are going to be less than that. I ha- there's not a whole lot of places where you just like a sheer fall off. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, over on the East coast, those guys, they, and I know some guys in around, you know, the mouth of the river on the West side of Venice, especially they, uh, they have places that are just like rocks, big rocks. Mm-hmm. is what it seems like almost like you're a group of fishing on a big rock yep um you just kind of go up on it and they're catching them in those places too that's pretty cool man <laughs> yeah, just, it is. Uh, it's kind of kind of like a uh kind of like a blackfish or a uh or a leg man you just absolutely never know where one's gonna show up like yeah. boom you know like if they're gonna be oh in. yeah they and they're there's a lot of swordfish out there i i think these long line boats that are fishing out way deep are catching some really big fish we have some really big fish in the Gulf. I mean, I, I got to witness those guys catch that 500 pounder this summer. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there's no doubt we, there's some giants here. I'm just, you know, we just got to keep, you know, exploring to find where they're at. Yep. And take care of them too. We were talking about earlier. There's a bunch more people fishing. I mean, you got to be careful with the small oh, ones. Yeah. And, and like you were saying, you were catching a bunch of small ones. I think that's a good thing. I mean, it is a big Gulf, but. You can outfish a pond no matter how big it is. Yeah, golly. I think we're the nursery pretty much for it. And and one thing that a lot of people don't understand, I think our sword, there's plenty of swordfish in my opinion. The thing about it is if we don't catch our swordfish, the allotted amount, which we never get close to, if we don't catch our swordfish, they'll just give them to another country that will most definitely catch them. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. They're, they're controlled federally and it they'll they'll give those to another country and they will most definitely catch them you know they it may be out of their part of the world but these these swordfish swim all over the place they're not i i don't remember exactly the numbers on it but i know michael Pittman tagged those fish over there um at the mouth of the river and one of those fish was caught again in the same spot like i don't remember i want to say it was 500 days later or maybe it was 800 days later and then Another fish he tagged in the same spot was caught in Nova Scotia. Oh wow! Golly, that's so, wild. You know, you know these these yeah, pelagics move. You know, uh, heck, there was a uh, blue marlin that just caught in the um, yes up there yeah. in North Carolina. Five hundred nautical miles. Yeah, wow. I mean that's wild to travel that. Yeah. You think about one a single fish traveling that far. That's crazy. It is fifty five hundred. And it miles. was all, it was it only took him like a it was only a year that you know. Yeah, he crossed the equator. The didn't, didn't he cross the Didn't he cross the yeah. equator? Yeah. Yeah, he I mean, moving. he and, and and who knows? I don't I don't know how long it actually took him to swim that far. He might have just been there in one spot for a while and just left one day and swam all the way there. And just yeah, true. You know, who knows how long it would actually take that fish to get there? Yep, and that's crazy um, to think about. That's cool stuff. It is. Maybe we can start tagging some of these swordfish around this area and see where they're going and if we have any resident fish, et cetera. That'd be cool. I uh, I got I got an idea for the pop off tags would be cool. The swordfish swim so fast, I think it'd take a really good anchoring system. It would. To, and they're uh, so crazy, man. To to uh to keep keep the tag in there, you know what I mean? But it'd be really cool to to set yeah. them. 
you know, if you could set them like six months from now and a year and, and kind of space out, space mm-hmm. out some tags for when they're going to pop off. And then, uh, then get the location you know, and all the data. It's be crazy to look at the data. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like temperature, cha- temperature changes, you know what I mean? Like what oh, the temperature yeah, is sure. down the bottom to the surface. And then, you know, yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Oh my goodness. It'd be unbelievable. You know, that's incredible to think about one swimming from Gulf of Mexico to Nova Scotia. Golly. I mean, that's a, that's a haul. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and you think about the, just the change of the, of the, uh, of the ecosystem too, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That they're living in, you know, unbelievable. I mean, Nova Scotia, that's a, that's a long way from here. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's the kind of the same trek that the blue fans make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True. Very cool stuff, man. That's a great report. Captain Dustin. Thanks for joining us today, man. If people want to patronize the Fairhope fish house, what's the best way to, uh, get up with you and get some fresh fish. Um, they can find us on our website or they can call me directly at 251-377-7135, you know, for information on the fish house and information on fishing charters. Very cool, man. We appreciate it. We look forward to talking with you next time, buddy. Be safe out there. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. That wraps up another great segment. Let's take a few minutes to check out a few more of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Riccadoni Family Dentistry. You're going to need a good dentist, so you may as well make an appointment with fellow angler Josh Richardoni. He provides services for all ages and accepts most dental insurances. Do not let an achy tooth ruin a day on the water. Call today to book an appointment at 251-342-6672. And also brought to you by l and Marine. l and Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoon boats, to bigger bay boats and offshore hybrids. l and Marine LLC prides itself on its customer service and knows how important it is to have someone you can trust and to be taken care of. They are locally owned and regularly support the community. Elena Marine provides superior customer service and has an entire team that consists of professional sales members, finance experts, service technicians, and a knowledgeable parts and accessory staff to support you. Go visit their friendly, reliable, and experienced staff now located only six miles north of I-10 at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or give them a call at 251-937-1380. And also, Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Sam's also has tackle experts and podcast contributors Chris Beche and Dusty Hayes on hand to answer any questions you may have about any type of local fishing and can also repair your rods and reels if necessary. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. All right, Captain Richard, you know we got to do what did you learn, man? What'd you pick up from today? A lot of good stuff. Yeah, a whole lot going on there, man. I, I really enjoyed that uh, that last segment with uh, with Dustin there. It's really neat listening to how they do things different. You know, they've they've uh, they found a little a little niche market over there, you know. For sure. Um, and to, it's a great uh, thing. It is. It is. Man, just to just to think, man, you can get some the freshest quality fish, you know, and they're 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 making videos and showing you how they're doing it and whatnot and taking care of the quality of the fish and, and, and all that. And, and that's just, that's just pr- pretty cool. You know, it's a big deal. not really another, a lot of every, uh, other fish markets in our area that are doing something not near on the level that they're doing it, you know? So that's, that's really, really neat. But man, what I learned, you know, same thing we've kind of been talking about. I've got this transition phase. It's obviously working really good on this moon phase deal that, uh, that Dustin's figured out offshore on swords, yep. uh, which is cool, you know, and that, I tell you, that just comes with experience. You know what I mean? Being out there, time on the water. Yeah, time on the water, knowing where to be when. Log books. Yep, yep, knowing where to be when. Yep, and uh, yeah, you said log book. That's uh, That's a real good point definitely something i've been paying attention to as i've gotten into the uh doing some of that uh that sword fishing is uh logging that moon phase and like and, he was uh, talking about things lining up he knows mm-hmm. what's he knows what's lining up that's right and that just takes experience time experience and nobody's gonna hand that to you you know yep. what i mean uh that that's something that's got to be learned and and done on your own you know uh one thing uh uh wesley hallman's uh, one of his little sayings he's told me in the past is the hardest fish to catch are another man's fish. You know what I mean? And getting yep. out there and figuring it out on your own and putting your own puzzle together is the, is the best thing you can do versus kind of, you know, chasing things around yep. to a degree. But, uh, but yep, it's springtime. Uh, everything's, everything's coming together, seeing a little bit of inconsistencies here with, <laughs> uh, with fishing, you know, uh, heck, Pat, I think Pat said it perfect. What? 
consistently inconsistent. Oh yeah, consistently <laughs> inconsistent. That's right. But uh, that was a pretty good sum up. That's just that's just part of it, though. You know, that's just absolutely part of uh, fishing in March. You're gonna have like some really really banner good days. You know, uh, Captain Bobby and I compare notes all the time, and he's he's had some really good trips, and he's had some tough trips, and 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 I've done the same, and so has Patrick. You know, here in the past couple of weeks. You know, you find a lot of daylight some days, find none the next, you know, uh, the yep. others. So, uh, but I, I really think is, is, you know, looking forward, the, the temperature and everything's going to kind of level out and hopefully we just need a little bit of consistency to the weather. And I think the fishing will kind of take care of itself. Yeah, it'll be cool. I might, uh, go back and I'd be curious to see, to listen to this week's show last year, mm-hmm. you know, in the year before, even to see if there was a pattern at all, if we were still singing the same kind of weird, inconsistent blues. Yeah. It, it, it always seems, like I said, it always kind of seems the same to me, you know, as I've been kind of chit chatting with, you know, customers and anglers and folks at the dock and everything. Yep. It's March. It's inconsistent. Like always, you know, it's just, yeah. a, it's just that it's that transition month. And usually the thing that's kind of saving us this time of year is the bull reds and the sheep head. But yeah. of course, you know, you got the weather to deal with and whatnot. So, uh, cause it likes to blow in the spring yep. as we know. So, you know, you gotta just kind of, uh, take your opportunities as they as gotta they go present themselves. Gotta that's, go fishing. That's it. I picked up big time from Dustin was the search and destroy kind of deal. Go, go exploring you know Mm -hmm. spots are spots i mean you know where the hot spots are for those kind of fish but go find your own fish i think that'd be really cool yep yep that's uh that's turn on your bottom machine and and put out some wahoo lures or whatever and let her roll that's it cruise around yep Yep. um it's the only way you're gonna find it yep you can cover a lot of ground doing a little trolling like that especially you know like what he was kind of talking about with the uh with the maps you know that they don't they show you a lot but they don't always show you everything getting in some getting in that right depth aerial on that contour and following it along yep. uh you got a real good Make shot we got a real good shot at uh maybe catching a wahoo and then also uh finding something and th- i tell you the thing about the sword fishing deal that's so cool too is a lot of times uh if you do find something kind of cool man i can't tell you how many times we ever made a drop and like as soon as the bait comes off boom you're bit yep you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to there's fish down there usually. Yeah, to to make a to make a short drift across something or You're whatnot. Right. And um Yep, it's a great point too. Yep. Just see what happens, man. You never like I know. Said, let's go fishing. You gotta go, you gotta go to know. You gotta go to know. So, All right, man. It's been fun today. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate you having me over here, man. Folks want to get up with you and book an inshore or an offshore trip. What's the best way to get in touch with Captain Blood? Yep. Uh look me up on uh Cold Blooded Fishing. Telephone numbers on there, 459-5077. We're on uh Facebook and Instagram. That's that's all of them. Yep, yeah, that's ways to get a hold of. I'm not TikToking like Captain Patrick yet, but uh one day maybe not he got a little millennial over him i guess so. <laughs> he does he's very <laughs> ambitious on the technology oh yeah well man i enjoyed it thanks for joining me today cap yeah buddy i look forward to the next one all right guys that wraps up another great segment let's take a quick break check out a few more of this week's great sponsors that segment was brought to you by photonist defense Photonist Defense is proud to offer the PD Pro line of night vision systems. The PD Pro series is the world's smallest and lightest night vision goggles built around the Photonist 16 millimeter filmless 4G image intensifier tubes and their hybrid filmless 18 millimeter image intensifier tubes. The ultra light, ultra compact night vision systems deliver cleanest image, best resolution, smallest, most transparent halo, and best overall performance and function of any night vision system available. The PD Pro line consists of the PD Pro M 16 millimeter monocular, the PD Pro B 16 millimeter binocular, and the PD Pro Q panoramic night vision system. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting. Fortified Roofing Pros. Do you need a new roof? Do you have wind or hail damage? You may qualify for a free roof. Foster Contracting will inspect and provide you with an estimate, stress-free, and they will handle your claim with your insurance. Your roof is your first line of defense this storm season. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your day. Foster Contracting has you covered. Check them out at www.fortifiedroofingpros.com or give them a shout at 251-447-2978. That wraps up another great show, folks. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Subscribe to our email list, and we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. We'll talk to you all next week. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by 
Test Calibration. Test Calibration is your source for sales and service of diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. They offer high quality, easy to use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. And also brought to you by BoatersList.com. If you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Sign up at BoatersList.com to find a company to work with on your next boat project. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at TheCoastalConnection.com. And also brought to you by Bahio Sunglasses. See more, catch more. Experience the clearest lenses on the planet with Bahio Sunglasses. Try on a pair at your local retailer or check out BahioSunglasses.com to see for yourself. And also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baya, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timber land, farmland, recreational land like hunting land, or even agricultural land or ranch land like horse farm, drop me a message at jbaya at nationalland.com. That's J-B-A-Y-A at nationalland.com. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Are you tired of stinking baits? Fish Bites don't stink or leave a stink on hands and everything else. Won't come off the hook during a hard cast or in rough waters. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits and tackle at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea temps, altimetry, currents, and watercolor at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. Also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters.